Romans chapter 1 is where we're going to be. Uh, you know, the beginning of a journey is, uh, it's usually rather exciting, and especially so if the journey is a long and significant one. That's how I feel today as we begin our journey through our swimming in the river that is Paul's letter to the Romans. I've preached a few sermons in my life from the book of Romans, but I've never endeavored to teach through the epistle as I intend now so to do. And as we begin, I am mindful of the historic importance of, of this letter of the apostle. It's a portion of scripture that has been used by God in a singular way throughout the centuries of the church. The names of Augustine and Luther and Wesley, certainly prominent in the Christian Hall of Fame, and all three of these men trace their conversion back to their encounter with Paul's letter to the Romans. Augustine was the only son of a woman named Monica. She had given her only son to God. She had prayed that he would know and serve Christ, but instead, he became an educated libertine. He had a live-in girlfriend. He was heavily into what they would have considered New Age religion. He had thoroughly rejected his mother's faith, but she continued to pray for her son, who, who could have been a poster boy for the doctrine of total depravity. And as she prayed, things only got worse. Her son was sent to a new assignment to Milan, Italy, known as the Mecca for the debased. So there he went, far away. He was entrapped in a lifestyle of self-indulgence and, indulgence and false religion. So, what are the odds of a man like that becoming a devout Christian believer like his mother? I mean, there, there was no hope to be seen. No, no hope, but God. But God. Say that with me, but God. This great God one day led a curious college professor, Augustine, into a church in Milan just to hear the oratory of the famous pastor of that church whose name was Ambrose. He, he just wanted to hear how the man and observe how this man could move a crowd, and, and there he heard more than a moving speech. There he heard a word that sounded to him strangely like home. Soon after, he was moved to pick up a Bible, which Bible happened to fall open to Romans 13, verse 13, a verse which exposed the wickedness of his life, for it said this, let us behave properly as in the day, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy. And then he came to the punchline in verse 14. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lust. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. This man, who eventually became the famous Bishop of Hippo and the preeminent theologian of the middle centuries of the church, said that moment, at that moment, no further would I read nor did I need, for instantly as the sentence ended, by a light, as it were, of security infused into my heart, all the gloom of doubt vanished away. And you'll notice what year that was, 386. Fast forward now 1,350 years. A man named John Wesley, who also had an extraordinary mother, her name was... Susanna, who discipled 17 children in the ways of the Lord. At, uh, John, her, one of her many sons, had recently been a missionary to the Americas, but when he returned back to England, he discovered on his treacherous voyage by boat that whatever his faith was, it was not sufficient to give him confidence in the face of possible death. But on the evening of May 24, 1738, Wesley went very unwillingly to a little religious meeting on Aldersgate Street in London where he found a man reading, not preaching, but reading the preface to Martin Luther's commentary on the book of Romans. 
And on this night in that little chapel, Wesley said that, and I quote, at about a quarter of nine, I felt my heart strangely warmed, and he was never the same. I have a biography about Wesley entitled The Burning Heart. He was a man aflame with love for God, and it was Martin Luther's preface to his commentary on Romans that set his heart to burning. Or rather, we should say Jesus speaking through Paul, speaking through Luther, speaking through whoever this guy was reading to him on that service to his servant that did it. So 200 years and more before Wesley then, there had to be Martin Luther, the famed reformer from what we now know of as Germany. And his encounter with Romans was clearly life-changing and world-changing. Martin Luther was a devoted monk who was seeking to serve God, but finding no particular joy in the process. Instead, he only lived his life with this tremendous burden of guilt. He was a man without peace. But God graciously appointed for Martin Luther a mentor by the name of Staupitz, who encouraged the young monk to devote himself to the study of the scriptures, which is where Staupitz had discovered the keys to finding pardon and peace. And Martin Luther did this, and it was the book of Romans <laughs> that grabbed his attention. In a few weeks, we will study Romans 1, verses 16 and 17. These two verses were the keys that unlocked Martin Luther's heart, and indeed the Reformation that followed that. Luther said, Romans is the chief part of the New Testament and the perfect gospel. So unlike most of Paul's epistles, Romans was not written to address a particular problem or problems in a specific church. Paul had never been to Rome at this point, so his letter... This letter of Roman to the Romans was more generic in nature. It provides Paul an opportunity to simply set forth in writing a summation of what he saw as the most important things for the Jesus people to understand. And so it's as relevant today as it was in the first century. It's as relevant in western Pennsylvania as it was in ancient Rome. May God once again speak with transforming clarity and power from this letter written by his servant. And so we read the first seven verses. Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, who was born of a descendant of David according to the flesh, who was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead according to the spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for his name's sake, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. To all who are beloved of God in Rome, called as saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This is God's word. And the substance of the book of Romans begins really in verse 16 of this chapter. What we read today is the brief introduction to the epistle, which introduces us again to the author, the Apostle Paul, who said there in verse 1, Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. So the author of our epistle sets the table neatly for this first message today in which we consider the disposition, the authority, and the mission of our author. Now, most of our time will be spent on the disposition of the author, so let's start with a quick consideration of the other two ideas. First, Paul says that he is called as an apostle. This is the office. This is the credential that establishes his authority in the church. Scripture says that the church was built on the apostles and prophets. These apostles were those called out by Jesus himself to lead the church in its infancy, to lay the foundation for the church by their missionary activity, and especially by their teaching. If you look at this verse, you'll notice the the passive tense of the verb that he uses to refer to himself. He was called Paul did not volunteer for this job. He he never sent out a resume. He was apprehended by Jesus Christ. He was set apart by God for this work. Paul says in Galatians chapter 1 that God set him apart from his mother's womb. So how awesome is that? 
So it is in his role as an apostle that Paul writes to the Roman church. The other letters of Paul to churches went to those that Paul personally founded himself, but not this one. Nevertheless, his apostleship gives him credibility, gives him clout when he communicates to what was to him a distant body of believers. So we believe Paul wrote this from <clears throat> this particular letter from Corinth to a Roman church that was a blend of Jewish and Gentile believers, but mostly Gentiles. And, uh, and you'll recall that for Paul, this was his distinct calling among the apostles to focus on the growing Gentile church. Ephesians 3 and verse 8 is sort of uh, my life verse. And there Paul wrote this, to me, the very least of all saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ. And that leads us to our next idea from verse 1, which is the man's mission. You could also call it Paul's message because his mission and his message were essentially one and the same. His message is the gospel, and his was a gospel mission. But what is the gospel? What does that word mean? It is, it is good news. It is the unfathomable riches of Christ. It is the story of his perfect life, his atoning death, his valid, validating resurrection, his triumphant ascension, and his present reign in heaven as a gracious king. Paul says that he, Paul, was set apart for the gospel of God. It's God's gospel. It's a joy for us to promote it and to spread it. Now, some of you are in, in jobs that you really enjoy. And uh, you're, maybe, maybe you're a salesman, and you sell something that you are convinced people need to have. I see a couple of high school math teachers here, and, and maybe they just love trigonometry and, want, and are inspired that kids would grasp it <laughs> and grow from the study of it, uh, to share something you really believe in, that's a real privilege. Some of you, as I say, get to do that in your job, so did Paul. He preached this gospel with confidence and with gladness and with perseverance in the face of much hostility because he truly had this in his pocket. It is God's gospel. Why do you keep going, Paul? The last place you went, they threw stones at you. The place before that, they threw you in jail. Why do you keep doing this? Settle down, get a real job. No, this is God's gospel. Paul was sold out to it. Acts chapter 20, verse 24, he says, I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself, so that I may finish my course and the ministry which I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God. The gospel of blank. What do you put in that blank? <laughs> the gospel of blank. I mean, you could put many wonderful things in that blank, right? Just many of them just are referred to in the New Testament. And we come to, when we come to verse 16 in a couple of weeks, we will do exactly that. The reality is that the gospel, the euangelion in the Greek, is the theme of Romans. It is mentioned by name six times in just the first chapter. With that in mind, then, we will move on to our next point for today in confidence that we'll have many wonderful Sundays together unpacking the gospel of God. But as noted, our major focus for today is on Paul's self-reference. As a bondservant of Jesus. Now this is common language for Paul. He says something similar in most of his epistles. Titus 1 verse 1, I'm a bondservant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Philippians 1.1, 1, 1. Paul, a bondservant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Okay, the Paul and Timothy bondservants of Christ Jesus is... Philippians 1. In verse 2, Paul references the Old Testament prophets, and he says that his mission and his message are connected historically with theirs. Interestingly, that title of bondservant uh, does the same thing. This was the way the Old Testament prophets would speak of themselves. The prophets of old were referred to as the Lord's servants. Daniel said in chapter 9, verse 6, in his prayer of repentance, he says, "'We have not listened to your servants, the prophets.'" God says through Jeremiah, in Jeremiah 7, 25, since the day that your fathers came out of the land of Egypt until this day, I have sent you all my servants, the prophets. 
Moses, who was the greatest prophet of the Old Testament era, and he was routinely identified as Moses, the servant of the Lord. And Joshua, when he replaced Moses, took to himself that exalted title. When God spoke to Samuel, we have a new baby Samuel in our midst, but the original Samuel, uh, and, uh, and God spoke to Samuel at night, and how did Samuel respond? He said, Behold, Lord, your servant heareth. David's self-designation was also the servant of the Lord. All the prophets, if you had seen their business card, <laughs> uh, would have said, you know, prophet or servant of Yahweh the Lord. So now, as a New Testament agent of Revelation, the Apostle Paul, picking up on that same title, leading with it as he introduces himself to the Roman church, servant of the Lord. Now, does a self-designation as that tell us anything? Well, how do you identify? <laughs> It's a loaded question nowadays, isn't it? How do you identify? Who are you? Who? What is the core of your identity? Nowadays, there's a, a great deal of pressure to define yourself by your sex, also known as gender, I guess. Uh, others want you to define yourself by your sexual orientation. Others want you to be defined by your race. Is that what should matter most to us? Are there other things? Are you primarily a doctor or a Christian? A homeschool mom or a follower of Jesus? A Republican or a child of God? What about your designation of others? I mean, suppose someone asks you, who is Brooke Hopkins? How do you answer that, what do you say? Is, uh, oh, Brooke's a great musician? Brooke is Gala's husband? Brooke is Olivia's dad? Or is he preeminently a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ? I, I believe that's a very revealing question about what you think is truly important. You see, we designate people by that which we deem more important about them, whether that be a position or an accomplishment or a relationship. What you pick, boy, that depends on your values. And I do find it most interesting that Paul did not designate himself by his job or his family or his status or his accomplishment. He did not say, I am Paul of Tarsus, pastor of the 2,000-member church at Ephesus. He said, I am a bondservant of Jesus Christ because nothing is more important about any human than that. Paul identifies himself by his relationship with his Lord because that was what best explained who he is. He says, I am a servant, and in itself, being a servant's not that significant. If someone tells you that they work as personal aid to Taylor Brown, <laughs> you might not be especially impressed. But what if they said, I'm the personal aid of Elon Musk? Oh. <laughs> or the President of the United States. Nothing special about being a servant, but if you serve someone that is notable or powerful, that servanthood can become your glory. Look at whom Paul served. He isn't servant to a president or a king, but he's the servant of the king of kings and the Lord of lords, and he gloried not in whom he had under him, but in whom he had over him. That is to be our glory brothers and sisters. It doesn't matter what great things you've accomplished, what great titles you have won. There is no title greater than this, a bondservant of Jesus Christ. In the Greek, the word that is used there is doulos. The New American Standard translates it as bondservant, which is a little awkward and kind of long, but they do that because the meaning of the term doulos falls somewhere between our thinking about a slave and our thinking about a servant. The doulos was not a slave of the chains and whips variety which we often associate with the institution, but neither was he a servant who worked under a simple labor management agreement. He could not go on strike because a doulos was not free to quit. He was bound to his master who had bought him. And so the translation, bond servant. He was in truth something of the possession of his master. So when Paul says he is a doulos of Christ Jesus, he was not only telling you who received his service, but who, in fact, owned him, whose he was. Did you know that if you are a Christian, you are owned by Jesus Christ, your Savior? Is, is that a part of your self-image? 
1 Corinthians 7, verse 23. You were bought with a price. Read that out loud with me. You were bought with a price. You belong to Christ. And oh my, does that truth ever have some powerful implications. The most important implication is that if Christ is your master, then nothing and no one else is. Think about that. Think about what the Bible says. You cannot serve God in money, for no man can serve two masters. 1 Corinthians 7, 23 goes on. It says, you were bought with a price. Do not become slaves of men. Yeah, good. Look, Galatians 1, 10. For am I now seeking the favor of men or of God, or am I striving to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. Same truth. If you are like Paul, if you are a card-carrying servant of Jesus Christ, you are placing all else in subordination to that one supreme allegiance, and and I'm, I'm talking with my mouth about some form of slavery, but in my heart, I'm thinking, freedom, freedom. When Christ is your master, you are free from bondage to everything else. You're free from men, you're free from their opinions, and that, that's glorious. Martin Buxbaum said, and I quote, freedom is being able to do what you please without considering anyone except your wife and the police and your boss and your insurance company and your doctor and your neighbor and all federal and state authorities. There you go. No, no, freedom is having one boss who is demanding, but oh so very gracious. And you know how it is, from junior high school or middle school on, most of us are tossed about by the opinions of others. Some of us despise ourselves because we don't rate in the area of physical attractiveness as some would see it. Some of us feel useless because we, I don't know, we aren't quite the breadwinner we were hoping we would be. Some of you spouses walk around with a weight on your soul because you know your husband and your wife is, uh, they're kind of dissatisfied with you. But if that's the way we think, we are still tied by mental cords to the opinions of men, to the values set forth by this corrupt world. And God calls you to break free and to serve Christ and to serve Christ alone. You see, we get so worried over things that our real master doesn't care about because you still want to please human beings. Good news. Good news. In our bondage to Christ, we are freed from human opinion. We have one master, and to him we answer. Another wonderful implication of being a bondservant is that it frees us from self-seeking. We can get off that awful treadmill of having to make sure that we, I, get treated right and having to fight for our rights because if you're really a doulos, really a slave of Jesus, I mean, what rights do you really have? So many of us live our lives in a state of perpetual offendedness. We get our feathers ruffled at the slightest indication that we are regarded with anything less than the highest honor. Some of you aren't paying enough attention to me right now. (laughs) But bond servants don't struggle with that. Bond servants are interested in the treatment the master is getting, but not about themselves. Their status frees them from that concern. In his book, uh, Rebuilding Your Broken World, Gordon MacDonald writes this, You know if you are a servant by how you react when you are treated like one. Wow. Wow. I'm going to run that by you again. You know that you're a servant by how you react when you are treated like one. A real servant spirit is not easily offended because it is free from self-seeking. So by our attachments to Jesus, we're freed from men, we're freed from self. One other thing I want you to see, see if you can identify what this third one is from the text in Romans chapter 6, which we'll get to some months or years or decades out in the future, (laughs) Romans 6, 16. But thanks be to God that through you, though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. And having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. Then Romans 6, verse 22. Now having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, you derived your benefit resulting in sanctification and the outcome eternal life. Romans 8, verse 2. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. 
Do you get it? Do you see what else we're freed from? As you become Christ's servant, you become free from the dominion of sin over your will. You don't have to sin anymore. <laughs> There's a whole sermon in that thought. But what I want you to point to, or what I want to point you to, is the idea that our servanthood is related to our freedom. As paradoxical as that may strike us, but the plain fact is that there is no such thing as this idea of freedom, absolute freedom from everything and everybody. No. Romans 6, 16 again, you know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience or slaves of the one whom you obey, either <coughs> of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness. It's an either or. You either serve sin or you serve Christ. Bob Dylan in his uh, Christian season back in the 80s sang a song called You Gotta Serve Somebody, and he sang, it may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you're going to have to serve somebody. And Paul said, I am a bond servant of Jesus Christ. How about you? Whose slave are you? Your slave to your mother? To your husband? To your boss? To your culture? To your Instagram feed? To your lust? The true Christian. He's a servant of his master. And remember that no matter what you come to think about your Christianity in the final analysis, it is not primarily a lifestyle. It's not primarily a set of rules. It's not even a set of beliefs, but a relationship with one who is our Savior, who is our Creator, who is our Redeemer, who is our Shepherd, who is our Master. Paul tells us in that one word, doulos, that he is a man with a master, and just because he is a man with a master, he's also a man with a mission, and it was the Master's mission, and that mission was to preach a message which was the master's message, and he carried out the master's mission by preaching the master's message, and thus he became a man with a master and a mission and a message, a bondservant of Jesus Christ and his apostle. And now we have finished verse 1. <laughs> Only 431 more to go. Let's pray, and as we do, pray with thanks and prepare our hearts for the Lord's Supper. And so, our Father, as we begin this journey through Romans, we want to thank you. That is a, is a book, it's a letter about our Master, who is our Savior, who brings us good news. And we rejoice in that good news. God, we pray that we would grow in our comprehension of it, that that message that Paul offers us, Lord, would grip our hearts as it did his and it would transform our lives, maybe our family, certainly, Lord, our community and our church as well. So, God, apply these things to us by your Spirit as we study them. And even as you did an awesome work in Augustine and Luther and Wesley through the, the wisdom and the truth of this book, do an awesome work at North Park Church in these months ahead. We thank you that we get to remember your grace regularly in our church calendar. We thank you that we celebrate a Savior who has died on our behalf, who has forgiven our sin. Thrill our hearts as we share now in this communion, this remembrance of all that Jesus is and all that he's done. We ask this in his name. Amen.